Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 163, 221B Con. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, hello and welcome once again to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. And I'm Bert Wolder. Ah, and here we are, ready to con you into attending a major show. No, there, there will be no con. You know, I, I have to say, I, I, I try to be very careful in this interview <laughs> saying con it just, it feels off to me saying they're putting on a con. con! Because <laughs> I, I, I have flashbacks to the Maria Konnikova interview where we talked about the confidence game. Yes, I wonder whatever happened to Maria. She's probably sitting somewhere, you know, in sort of a room underneath a brightly lit bulb, sitting around a round green bez covered table betting five hundred thousand dollars on poker <laughs> she is you know Mar maria was working on uh, a book related to poker and she decided to take a sabbatical to actually put some skin in the game literally and she tried her hand at playing professional poker and you know what she was so good at it <laughs> she put an indefinite delay <laughs> on writing her book yeah so. Yeah, well, according to Maria Konnikova, you know, I can no longer afford not to do this. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful excuse. Uh, I, I think we should try that. Yeah, you first. <laughs> I don't have the prerequisite uh, psychological background uh, in, in studies that Maria had. But, you know, if you yeah. would like to listen to Maria and her time with us, she was actually on uh, two shows with us in the past. The first one of course, was episode 54, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes. That was her very first appearance and first uh, book related to Sherlock Holmes. The second was episode 91, The Confidence Game. And we'll have links to both of those shows in the show notes. However, we are not here to talk about or to Maria. We have two other fine guests who will be joining us momentarily quick bit of housekeeping before we do that. I uh, wanted to let you know that the show notes for this episode are available at ihose.co slash ihose163. That's all lowercase. You can, of course, comment directly on our website on that page, uh, and you can also leave us comments all over the social web, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We are I Hear of Sherlock in every one of those instances. You can also reach us via email, comment at IHearOfSherlock.com, and you can reach us via phone, 774-221-7323. That is our phone number, 774-221-READ. And later in the program, we will have some listener comments, so make sure you stay tuned for that. We are pleased to welcome Heather Holloway and Crystal Knoll to the program. They are both Sherlockians of note in the Georgia area, and they are co-founders of 221 Beacon. 
a fan convention for all things Sherlock Holmes. And because they must do everything as a matched set, they were both named co-editor of the Serpentine Muse recently, the official publication of the adventuresses of Sherlock Holmes, something we want to hear more about from both of them when we speak. Uh, Heather discovered Sherlock Holmes a little earlier than Crystal, as you will hear, but no less enthusiastically. Let's get to the interview. Heather and Crystal, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. Well, we'd like to start with you, as we do with all of our guests, and that is by asking you how you first came to meet Sherlock Holmes. Why don't we start with you, Heather? Um, well, uh, I discovered Sherlock Holmes in ninth grade. My English teacher, Mrs. Phyllis Bright, uh, assigned the Speckled Band to our class, and we read it. And I'll be honest, I didn't care for it that much. It was not my favorite story. But while we were discussing it, she um, was talking about the construction of the story, and she said that Arthur Conan Doyle um, always had the end uh, planned out before he started so that he could, uh, you know, plot the story. And I thought that was interesting. So I went to the library and I got a copy of the the entire canon and I read all of it. And um, I was like, oh, I like a bunch of these stories. And I was kind of a Sherlockian from there on. Hmm. So I, um, I guess Mrs. Phyllis Bright really deserves my thanks. I should track her down. <laughs> Now, what, what were some of the stories that stood out to you uh, in, in juxtaposition to the Speckled Band? Um, my favorite story is the Musgrave Ritual. Um, I really liked that one. It just seemed creepy with a nice, you know, guy getting stuck and buried alive, buried alive and <laughs> old crown and um, uh, like a ritual. I liked that kind of thing. Um, I liked the Redheaded League. Of course, I liked Scandal. Um, obviously, um, there's not a lot of stories that I don't like. I mean, even the speckled band I like, it just wasn't my favorite. Yeah. I, I guess if I just read that and not known that there were others, I would have been like, okay, that's okay. Yeah. Um, but once I started reading all of them, I just fell in love with it completely. You know, it's funny. I had a, uh, a friend in college to whom I was introducing to Sherlock Holmes and I was doing it via the Granada series and at the beginning of every episode, I would say, now, just so you know, the butler did it. And, <laughs> you know, it's the old cliche. And then, then we finally got to the Musgrave ritual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she was like, the butler did do it. I said, well, you know, one of the stories has to has to happen like that. It had to work out at some point. Exactly. One day it's going to be with us. <laughs> Law of number. <laughs> yeah. Now, Crystal, what about you? How did you first encounter Sherlock Holmes? Uh, actually, it's a good thing you started with Heather on this question because my origin comes actually from Heather. So after we graduated college, we had gone back to Georgia Southern to um, listen to um, Angela, Angela Davis. Davis speak. Hmm. Um, and while we were going headed down to Statesboro, we were in the car and Heather was talking about how we had to make sure that the hotel had PBS so that we could watch this new series of Sherlock that was coming on. And. Um, so we called, of course, and then we ditched half of our friends and went back to the hotel and watched the first episode. And I knew I was hooked before we ever made it out of John Watson's flat um, because <laughs> I I really was, was drawn in immediately. And one of Heather's favorite stories. Yes, my favorite story. Go ahead, tell it. You like it so much. Okay, so in the first episode, first of all, I didn't think the show was going to be any good. I was like, it's going to suck, but it's Sherlock Holmes. And I love Sherlock Holmes, so we're going to watch it just to see how bad it is. <laughs> because I didn't, I thought it, a modern-day Sherlock Holmes sounded awful to me. And I hated the Robert Downey Jr.'s mo junior, junior movie, so I really thought this was going to be bad. And so uh, we're watching it, and Crystal was just like, okay, fine, because you're my best friend. We'll do this. And so we're sitting there. We get to the part where Mycroft picks up. Um, John and they're talking and you don't know it's Mycroft yet. And so I'm, I'm laying on my bed in the hotel room 
Crystal, I think, is laying on her bed. Mm-hmm. And I go, um, oh, this is good because they want us to think that's Moriarty. But I think that's Mycroft. And she goes, shut up, Heather. I'm watching this. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Crystal, in. <laughs> she she did edit down my language there, which I appreciate. <laughs> that's true. Um, <laughs> but then we went to the Waffle House, like you do in Georgia when you are hungry. And um, we were sitting there and we were like so upset we had to wait a whole week for another episode. And then it occurred to me that she had mentioned it had already aired in the UK and we had the Internet. So I'll let you make your own deductions from there. Ah. (laughs) And shortly, shortly after that, um, we came home and we have what I lovingly call my Victorian Christmas in which we sat and did our own little almost book club for the canon, and I read it for the first time, and I was hooked. And by time May rolled around, we were planning a con. So, I mean, it must have been good. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> wow. Well, that, and that's that's pretty aggressive. I mean, so so you were hooked on on the character, on the concept and everything. Uh, and, and let's be clear, the very first episode of Sherlock mm-hmm. was a study in pink. And yes. that is a, a, a very, uh, I think, uh, a very well done modern adaptation of a study in Scarlet. Um, you know, when you consider that, uh, you know, you're, you're dealing with uh, a, a doctor uh, in the English army who had served in Afghanistan, uh, he was coming back. I mean, it was just a perfect parallel. So, uh, Crystal, having never read a study in Scarlet before, you kind of came into it. Uh, reverse where where you you then went to read the book after having seen the show what what were your impressions of of the written sherlock holmes as as a result of starting with uh the, the televised sherlock holmes um i will say that it it really kind of intrigued me the way that the the character of sherlock holmes and in fact john watson as well even though they he was written into a certain time period, he is a fully three-dimensional character that can be transported into something like modern day. Um, and even in like a robot in the, you know, 22nd century or a dog in Sherlock Hound or a mouse in The Great Mouse Detective. That um, So when I read the canon for the first time, I guess because of that different perspective, I did impose my own... Sherlock, which was BBC Sherlock, onto my visual representation of the canon. So I, when I was reading it, I was seeing Benedict Cumberbatch or Martin Freeman or, you know, Mark Gatiss or any of these people as the characters. And I actually think that it gave me a slightly different perspective because I didn't have the same mind's eye that a lot of people had when they read it initially, because I wasn't lucky enough to, in high school or in middle school, to have been given the canon as a reading assignment, I know that our um, honors students got it, but I didn't because I wasn't an honor student because I didn't apply myself. But that's my story. Um, <laughs> but I will say that I really loved the fact that the stories were standalone and that I was able to read it. I was never smart enough to figure out. I'm definitely the John Watson of the Heather and me duo. Um, and I really kind of connected with the John Watson character more than the Sherlock character. And I kind of feel like, I don't like it should be introduced to so many people. So, so much earlier than at least I got it because of the fact that because they're standalone, because you can read one or two and in an afternoon, you really can reach out to this character and see how they will influence your life. Kind of talking in a circle there, but that's just my thoughts on it. Well, it's fascinating. What what appealed to you in the character? What uh, what are the big dimensions that you really found intriguing? I would I would honestly say that because I felt more connected to John Watson than Sherlock Holmes, it was the fact that he was in his own way a tragic hero, and he he really suffered here and there, and he could never get his feet underneath him really before something in his life drastically changed, but. He had such a level head and he was able to approach life and roll with the punches. And, you know, while he was not the smartest man in the room, he was the man that was counted on. He was the man who who is the reason that Sherlock Holmes could show his brilliance in a way. And he was our way of seeing Sherlock Holmes's brilliance because he was our medium. He was our television, our radio, our 
conductor you know, of conductor light. of light. Thank you. Um, and he, so my connection actually that I was drawn to wasn't necessarily Sherlock Holmes as much as it was John Watson. So, oh, but that's really interesting because that says so much about Martin Freeman's character that he created around Watson. So what attracted you was really Watson, the survivor, Watson, who survives challenges, surmounts challenges, who's had deep experiences, who's confronted with people he might not immediately understand, Watson, the steadfast. That's really lovely. That's, um, I don't know, in all the time we've talked to people about their first entry into the world of Sherlock Holmes, I don't know that we've talked to anyone who said, you know, for me, it was really Watson. That's great. And Look at me being a trendsetter. <laughs> <laughs> you are, because I still love Sherlock the most. <laughs> well, I, I think that makes perfect sense then why, as you just mentioned before, you, you immediately decided to put on a conference. Um, if, if you consider Watson as the everyman, and and you're connecting with, you know, someone who represents the common people. It would seem natural to want to connect other people with whom you perhaps have this interest in common, uh, and and get together and and discuss things. Is is that part of the part of what fueled the, this idea, or you know, how how did it really come about that you said, ah, you know, what we have to do, we have to put on a con. That's actually pretty close. (laughs) So what had happened was um, we were at a Doctor Who convention in Atlanta called Palmgate. It's now called Who-Lanta for anybody who wants to go. Yeah, it's a great convention. Sorry, what's it called now? Who-Lanta. And um, we actually ended up meeting uh, Taylor uh, Blumenberg uh, and Kath Brunke there, uh, two of the other directors. And we brought... Liz Elberger, who is no longer a director because she had twins and needs to focus on figuring out how to deal with two babies at once. But she's one of the founders and was a director up until last year. And uh, so the three of us and then Kath and Taylor had come together. We had gone to a panel on Sherlock Holmes that was run by, at the time, a man named Louis Robinson, who used to work with the BBC. Mm -hmm. And we came out of there, and I remember thinking – If I knew half of what that man has probably forgotten about Sherlock Holmes, that would be amazing. So, of course, we decompressed after the panel. Yeah, all five of us were standing around an ugly blue couch in the lobby. And we're like, you know, this is a great convention. I'm so glad they had the Sherlock panel. I wish they had more panels about Sherlock Holmes. And then somebody, and I don't remember who who it was. None of us do. uh, None of us do, said... um, gosh, somebody should have a Sherlock Holmes convention. And we were all like, yeah, that would be great. And I remember uh, Crystal said, um, I'm really into BBC Sherlock. I could do that. And, um, and Taylor said, I'm really into Robert Downey Jr. I could do that. And I said, well, I'm really into the canon, so I could do that. And we're all just sort of like, ha, ha. And then somebody said, well, why, why don't we? And, we, and so we we're like, well, I, I guess we could. And the next thing you know, we had a contract with the hotel and a website domain, anyway, it hadn't been built, but we owned the domain <laughs> for 221 Beacon, and that was within an hour yeah. of having made that decision. And the story behind the name is just simple, that the only thing that is the same in all of these is the address. Yeah. Hmm. So that's the reason we went with 221 Beacon as a name. And we did absolutely everything wrong, Yeah. as this, we found out later. <laughs> this con should have flopped. It should have flopped. We... Made every bad decision that could have been made, but it worked out by a miracle. So thank goodness. Well, what were what were your expectations uh, that very first year? Our our first contract with the hotel was for seventy five to one hundred and fifty people. It's one hundred twenty five people. One hundred twenty five people, and um, we had honestly two had two rooms for discussions, and they were like thirty five person rooms. They weren't even big rooms. And all we wanted to do was get together with people and just talk about Sherlock Holmes. That That is honestly it. And we ended up matching, like, the cap number, the 125, in the first day of registration when we finally opened it. Wow. And um, at the when we actually put on the con, we had just under 700 for our first year. <laughs> we had to go back to the hotel and renegotiate to get all the hotel space so that we could... Um, get more people. I know that Mary Lynn McKay, um, 
uh, said that when she heard about it, she was in the car and she pulled her car to the side of the road to register on the first day. On I-75. On I-75, <laughs> which is a huge uh, interstate, so that she could register because she, she was told that it was 75 to 125 people and she didn't want to miss out. And apparently that's what a bunch of people did on the Internet. And so when we realized that, we realized we, we needed more space immediately. And we uh, ended up buying out the hotel. We did end up wow. buying out the hotel. And so, uh, and then we were completely unprepared for that. And so we went and started asking all the anime cons in the area how what we could do. And they told us we were doing everything wrong, but we'd already done it. So there was nothing we could do but roll with it. So we did, and it worked out. Well, that's amazing. <laughs> and, you know, in, in Mary Lynn's defense, uh, I've been in Atlanta traffic before, so this really wasn't that heroic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it depends on if you were doing it during rush hour. That's I guess. true. Yeah, that's true. But what? So, so what would what would have been doing it right looked like if what you did was right, everything wrong? What when you when you plan a con, you are supposed to take at least two years in your planning stage. We did it in under ten months. You're supposed to have ten thousand dollars in the bank. We had a hundred dollars. <laughs> we had a hundred dollars and donated, donated web hus- web hosting. Um, you're supposed to have a general idea of what you want and how many people you're expecting. And we completely were wrong on the numbers that we were expecting. You're and supposed to have a base of volunteers. We had five people. <laughs> and you, um, you're supposed to have, um, I'm trying to think of, oh, event insurance. We didn't have any of that. We, we, didn't we just know. hope nobody died. We didn't even know until August that we were supposed to have event insurance. Someone told us that. We're like, oh, we need that? Oh, thank you. Thank you. We'll get that now. We had to track down another con to lend us tech because yeah. we didn't even have any sort of technolo- technology even planned out. Oh, no. The first year, Artsy gave us tech. Oh, yeah. Artsy gave us tech the yeah, first the year. Yeah, the Atlanta Radio Theater Company donated the tech, like um, microphones and speakers for the, um, for the panelists room. and the main room because we didn't have the money to pay for it at the time. So they, they very nicely brought it and set it up, ran it, and then took it down for us. And they did a show because they, they did, did a radio show. show. They do a show every year, and they're wonderful. Yep. They're up to doing two of them a, sh- mm-hmm. a year now. They do uh, one that is kind of a detective Sherlock Holmes, and then they do also a Jeeves and Wooster-based one. They do. Mm. Yes. So, so you, you found out from other event organizers that you were doing everything wrong, but what was the reception like by the attendees? Did they feel like you completely missed the mark on things or, or were they fairly? No, they actually, when we, we hold a panel at the very end of con called um, our last bow, everyone have a chuckle at that in which everybody gets to come and tell us what we did wrong and how much they hated it. Um, and I'm proud to say that they haven't done that. Um, they always have very nice things to say. They always have suggestions, which is great. But in that first year, it was, one big praise fest. It was really weird. I was thinking about it in the car today about how somebody said that the reason they thought it was organized so well is because it was uh, organized by women. And of course, we told them that, no, we had a lot of help. But um, <laughs> I really think that I really think that, that that's probably the only reason that we kept going, to be honest, was because of how well it was received. I mean, it was basically one big party that was like a two day event that everybody well, because we were planning for one year this wasn't supposed to be a continuing con until we had so many people and we were like oh okay well we can keep doing we'll just keep doing this until people stop coming and that was when we decided to to do a second year yeah when when we wrote the letter to go in the first program which heather was kind enough to write for us but she put it in great words and that is that if 15 people keep showing up we'll keep doing it because (laughs) It means so much to us and because it means so much to everybody who comes. It's now become almost like a giant family reunion. I mean, we, of course, welcome new people with with open arms. But, you know, it's one of those things that people just keep coming back and it's family. Well, sure. and, and the one thing that I find super interesting about 221B Con, um, Atlanta has more cons than any other city in the world. I mean, it has... What, I 43 mean, a year. 43 cons a year. Yeah. Um, we have Doctor Who cons. We have Dragon Con, which is huge. Anime cons, whatever you name it, we got it. And um, and so 
Crystal and I have been to a good many cons in Atlanta of different types. And so you get to know the con community and the type of people who go there and what they do when they're not at the conventions and stuff. And 221B Con has a really special group of people who come. And and it, it kind of reminds me, a lot of them aren't necessarily um, involved with the traditional Sherlockian society, like traditional Sherlockiana and stuff like that. But they remind me of that so much, of that group of people, because not only do they come to the con, but then when they go back to their homes, they, they form these other little communities. Like they have a secret Facebook group of just people who come to 221B Con huh. where they talk about the con and what they're doing in their lives. They have another group, which is called 221B Scribble Pals, which is a group of people who are, who, um, exchange letters and cards with each other. There's a tea exchange community of just people who go to 221B Con. And so just the fact that it's not just this one event, like people who go to say, you know, um, oh, I don't know, AWA, the um, Anime Anime Weekend Atlanta. They go and then they're, they go back home and they don't think about Anime Weekend Atlanta until the next year. But 221B Con, these people talk to each other every single day. They may live in different countries, but they still talk about, you know, Sherlock Holmes and what they're doing and what their lives are. And I just, I think that's so great. And I'm and glad that they do. One of the other things that has really kind of set 221B Con apart from the other cons that happen in the Atlanta area is that they, one of the things they told us was that we should always expect two thirds of our people to be local and one third of our, our attendees to travel in. We are absolutely positively the exact opposite we have one third of people that come from atlanta if that and everybody else comes from somewhere else we have people that come from south korea people that come from australia new zealand you know the uk scotland you know all kinds of of um we have germany like people come from all over just to have this this moment this one weekend a year and does does that kind of ratio uh, does does that make you treat the con the con any more seriously than you otherwise might, or would the the level of uh, of care and development that you put into it be the same regardless? Um, I think that just the type of people, at least that you know Heather and I are, and I believe the other directors as well, is that we would we would always put this much effort into anything we do because we we believe in things we do, and we know that if it's not worth doing then why bother mm. plus we were, we were organizers in college we organized so many things it's just in our blood we can't so, help her so why don't you talk a little bit about the directors you know you mentioned directors a couple of times so how how big is the tell us a little bit about the group that that now is uh, pushing this forward the current directors there are four of us so heather and i are two of them and then kath who is a um a youth librarian in Spartanburg and Taylor who, uh, Taylor Blumenberg, who is, um, in Charleston, who, um, is also one of the Baker street babes. Um, the four of us, uh, are the directors. And then we have a very dedicated staff of about six or seven that, um, that every year come and help us, uh, because we realized that it wasn't something we could realistically do with like five people. Um, and you know, we go throughout the year and promote the con and then we sit down when the, when it gets close and try to put it all together. (laughs) Basically the, um, the four of us who are directors, Kath, um, me, Taylor and Crystal, uh, we're the, we're the remaining ones who were the people who founded the con, um, with Liz. And so we're the ones who sort of make the big overwhelming decisions. Like these are going to be the guests. These are, you know, what we want to focus on this year. Um, and so, I mean, nobody, when we, this is the other thing we did wrong. Every, every group told us you have to have one person in charge, one person who has final veto power and tells people what to do. And we're like, that's not how we do things. No, we're, we're very on consensus we're, building. We like, we like consensus building. We're, <laughs> no, that, that, oh, that's dictatorial. And they're like, it'll never work. And it's worked so far. So <laughs> that's how we run it. But if there's a big decision to be made, everyone does have their kind of, um, their kind of specialization, so to speak. So Heather is in charge of guests. I do the hotel liaison. 
Um, Taylor is over registration and her and one of our staff members do volunteers and um, Kath does the website and a good bit of the social media as well as um, our merch and um, organizing the silent auction that we have every year. And Heather and I do programming this year. Programming does sometimes switch around to other people. We think it's the fun job. Um, but that so it's not been everyone's experience. <laughs> so everybody kind of has what they're over, but when it comes to a large decision, um, we all come together and make it. And, you know, whether it's a Facebook group chat that, you know, we just throw a question up to or an actual meeting, we, we tend to, to just roll with it as one big group. Yeah. Well, that's great. So the first one, uh, took place in what, 2010? Or 2011. We have to count. We, we can't remember now. 2013. 2013. <laughs> okay. All right. So the first one was 2013. Um, okay. How young and innocent I was back then. Yes. And then uh, we are now on number seven. Yeah, okay. number so, seven. So you immediately went back the following year. You, you were not going to wait the two years. You just said, you know, we, we did it in 10 months this time. Let's let's mount it again and, and do it exactly uh, in a year. Yeah, um, there's one thing that we we have learned about cons, and that is if you take a year off, mm, you're going to lose sure. most yes. of what your your attendees yeah, are. And sense. I know there are a lot of Sherlockian um, events and symposiums and things that are every other year, or every few years, and they they can survive like that. But as far as a con community goes, it's a little bit more difficult um, because of I guess people's attention attention span. Mm. I don't know, but yeah. it's harder to take breaks. Yeah. Well, and and I I do want to talk to you about uh, the second year, but you just mentioned other Sherlockian uh, symposia and and conferences. Were you aware of any of these when you started off on creating two two one Beacon? Um. Yes. Uh. We we were. Um. I, well, I speak. I can speak for me. I was I, not. I was. Uh. I and and we knew that they were kind of more scholarly, like. Um, mm-hmm. I used to be on the board of the Popular Culture Association, American Culture Association of the South, and they did scholarly conferences. And so I helped organize that back when I was a grad student. And so, and, and I didn't, and so I, I knew what went into organizing the more scholarly things. And that was what I kind of saw in the Sherlockian community, which are great because I love that, but it wasn't really what we wanted to do. We seemed like that had been done if you wanted to do that. There were a bunch of places you could go for that, but no one at that time had ever done like a fan convention, like multiple hours of programming at the same time and multiple days. And just like, you know, we we wanted that whole con experience with cosplay and, you know, up late night and, you know, that sort of thing is what we wanted because that's what we went to. That is what we enjoyed. So that's what we wanted to bring to it. And I will say that for me personally, the, when I did find out about them, because I didn't know about them when we first made the initial plan, because I was new to it all. um, One of the things that I kind of felt was that I, I don't consider myself scholarly. Okay. I don't consider myself an academic or anything like that. So the thought of a scholarly symposium or conference isn't really at the time wasn't really me as far as Sherlock Holmes goes or anything else for that matter. I wanted to go to a con where I could have a a random conversation with somebody in a bar and just, you know, talk about Sherlock Holmes and not have to worry that I was, you know, not smart enough for the conversation. Um, I've, which, I'd is all, her, which is her imposter syndrome. Yeah, go with it. Because she gave a rockin' presentation at Scintillation of Scion, for the record. <laughs> go but ahead, Chris. I, I feel like that's me as having grown as a person because I, <laughs> I, once I realized what these, what these meetings and what these, you know, conferences and things were and how they worked, that was a completely different and eye-opening experience for me that I could go and have all those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and while it's not the same thing as a con, it's still a lot of fun and, you know, I learn a lot and talk to a lot of different people. Well, I, that, that's just it. You know, I think uh, as you've been around more Sherlockians, you've, you've noticed that we all have this this thing in common where we like to get together around food and drink. Uh, and, and, and some of it's alcoholic drink, some of it is not, to each his own. <laughs> um, but it's about people talking to other people that happen to have this same interest and, and, and just getting to know each other as interesting individuals. 
Um, so I, I think that's, that's one of the things that brings us together as Sherlockians, regardless of how we got there or the type of Sherlock Holmes we're interested in or what have you. So as you've, as you've, uh, blossomed a little bit, have you, as you've explored the other, uh, worlds of Sherlockian events, what has the traditional uh, Sherlockian responded like to 221 Beacon, if, if there is such thing as a traditional Sherlockian? What kind of reception have you gotten? Uh, I will say that our very first year, we joke about having um, an advanced, an advanced guard, so to speak. <laughs> we had a handful of traditional Sherlockians that that made an appearance the first year, and um, it almost felt like they went <laughs> filling us out. <laughs> yeah, it almost felt like they went back and reported back to their their uh, their like minded folks. Um, I think that it's been mixed. That's what I'm going to say, um, without calling anybody out. The the thing is, is that there are a lot of people who immediately want to know about the con. They immediately want to know about what kind of things we talk about there and what we do and and things like that. But there are the occasional person that is very dismissive of it and um, just almost wants to pat pat us on the head and send us along our way. But that, that number has gone down a lot over the years well, as sure, they, they realize they've died. not going anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was kind of like a first second year kind of thing. Like I think they were waiting us out. There were a couple of people. I would say mostly overwhelmingly everyone was positive. Overwhelmingly mostly everyone was positive. Um I will say there was this one time when um we met some people at a con. They were older traditional Sherlockies, but they were also at a convention, a different convention, and they mentioned the Atlanta Scion. And we were like, oh, well, we we had looked at the bat, but we didn't know. And so what what do you think? And they were very adamant that we wouldn't like it, that we shouldn't come. And we we're like, well, we, we were thinking of, tra- of, you know, checking it out. And they're like, well, it's very much about, you know, the the books. And so you wouldn't like it. And I'm like, I love the books. That's my thing. And I like, actually remember the phrase, you're too young. Yeah. What? And I'm, like, I'm in my 30s. Well, I mean, how, how old do I have to be to get in the club? And, um, and <laughs> that's, that's and when you say, like, well, no, no. but we we're coming to your convention. It sounds amazing. We're, we're very happy. So they weren't, they weren't down on, on the con. And then we met Mary Lynn, who was like, you have to come to the Scion. You'll love it. These people are great. <laughs> and we went and we did. And those people who uh, will not be mentioned because they're lovely, but, um, uh, now we're like, we're so glad you're here. It's great. You know, you're going to do the quiz next time or whatever. Or, so, you know, that that sort of thing in the beginning. And then with the traditional Sherlockians, when we would go off to Sherlockian events, I think they were waiting us out on BBC Sherlock, a couple of people. They're like, as soon as BBC Sherlock ends, these people are going to go away. And once that kind of did stop and they were like, oh, wait, they're still here. Huh, that's interesting. So I haven't had anyone be even slightly rude or condescending I don't think in the last little bit. Yeah. Not in the last few years. It's been, yeah, no, everybody's been wonderful. And some people like, I mean, Jacqueline Morris gave us a donation the first year. She was so excited to hear us that we were having a con from the simulation of scions. Um, some people have been just amazingly supportive. Mary Lynn was immediately like, I want to do panels. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, uh, Dave McAllister was also really there and Howard Ostrom and like yeah. all these, all these people that, um, Bill Mason, you know, they, yeah. Yeah. If you watch that CBS clip from, uh, the first, the first year, no rocket came to do, um, some stuff on the con and it was on CBS Sunday morning. And if you do a pan, there's like one pan where you can see like a child, an 18 year old and like, uh, like a 70 year old all in the same thing. It was, it was really a good shot. It was really, a good uh, shot of the con because that's how the that's the breath of the people that come. That's perfect representation. So, yeah. so, so tell us a little bit about the programming this year. What do you? How, how have you structured it? And and for for someone who's um, who's new to this, what should they expect, or, or what would you tell them to entice them to come? Well, 221 Beacon, as our tagline says, is a fan con for all things Sherlock Holmes. And we add to that saying from the original canon all the way to modern and futuristic representations. <laughs> so there is something for everyone, whether it be um, a panel on animals in canon or discrimination in canon or a discussion on BBC Sherlock or um, 
the Robert Downey Jr. films or Miss Sherlock or, you know, even even some of the things that aren't necessarily Sherlock Holmes, but are similar to Sherlock Holmes, whether they are non Sherlock Holmes movies that the characters are are, um, you know, based off of Sherlock Holmes loosely or things like that. There's there's always something for for everyone at 221 Beacon. We try to mix things up. So for the for many years, we've had panels like um, Holmes through the ages, Watson's through times, Lestrade's I have known, or the, or the other Mycroft. I can't remember, but basically just talking about the, the different incarnations of uh, or depictions of the the characters. And so this year, Crystal and I were like, we're tired of that. Let's not. Let's try something else. This is actually Crystal's idea. It was an excellent idea. She's like, why don't we do um, like hounds through time? So we're gonna talk. Have a panel where we talk about. The different, um, the different film versions or, you know, like pastiche versions of Hound of the Baskervilles or, um, what are the other ones? The mini scandals. Yes, the mini scandals, things like that. So, um, just, we try to come up with different ways to look at, um, Sherlockian things and just come up with different conversations that maybe you haven't had before or that you want to have again, I guess. So and it's it's always interesting to see which panels people want back, um, yeah. whether it's whether it's Sherlock Holmes related or even writing related, because we do offer a few other um, panels that are on different things. Because let's be honest, when you have one hundred and fifteen hours of program programming to fill, yeah. you can you can add, you know, whatever the modern not modern, but the current interests are yeah. um, whether people want to learn about, you know, how to self publish or how to how to do research or build worlds for their characters to live in, or whether they want to just hang out and talk about Yuri on ice or check please, or, you know, whatever, whatever it is they want to talk to their friends about right then. So we, we luckily by offering so many hours, we can, we can hit a bunch of, of different topics. I mean, we've got a panel this year dedicated towards um, Edgar Allan Poe because it's the anniversary of his death. And, you know, we, we can, focus on these other things while at the same time still being Sherlock Holmes centric. Plus we also have a dance party, um, a, a burlesque and karaoke. So, I mean, you can always come out and just party with us. <laughs> so what are you singing in karaoke? Uh, well, I'm going to be honest. Uh, our kids really like panic at the disco. So probably <laughs> some panic at the disco uh, deep cuts and then mostly 80 power, 80s pop. <laughs> I, I, I will say that there's usually a director song, and yeah. I, I tend to skip it every year. But I guess I've got to step yeah, in since Liz is gone. Liz. Yeah, yeah, there's usually like one song where the directors come up and embarrass ourselves, and Crystal's always like, "Oh, I have to be somewhere. I've got important director business to handle." <laughs> well, somebody has to run the late night panels at yeah, the con that um, go on till you know two in the morning. I don't think the three minutes that it would take to sing Meredith Brooks would kill you. <laughs> We, we also have, um, it's, it's something to point out also that we also have a chosen charity every year and it's the Beacon Society again this year. And we try to do both a silent auction and then, um, the proceeds from the burlesque also go to them, um, so that we can, you know, focus on keeping Sherlock Holmes in the communities and keep Sherlock Holmes in schools. And, you know, for somebody like me who didn't have that option, it, it actually is a, is a really important thing. And so, um, you know, that's one of those good ways to raise money while still having a good time and doing all those things you love. Now, now for those people who might not know what a burlesque is, can you describe the burlesque you're about to do? <laughs> well, uh, I'm not doing any of it. <laughs> yes, we partner with uh, um, the Fandom Nerdlesque, which is um, a burlesque company in Atlanta that um, incorporates nerdy fandom things into a burlesque show. So it is so, sort of like, um, I don't want to say stripping. It's like, it's, it's like, not stripping. It's like classy, classy 30 stripping. Um, but with a, with a nerd theme. So, um, I'll tell this story. The, the first year we had it at our old, old hotel. Um, the, what's the woman's name who was our, our event manager? Come with Alicia? Yes, Alicia. She, we told her we were having the um the burlesque. I can tell she was a little worried about it because she never had one. She didn't know what they were like. And so she comes in and she's standing in the back just to make sure no shenanigans go down in this in this event space. And this guy comes out because it's it's men and women who do their little shows. And this guy comes out 
and he is dressed as Ron Weasley from Harry Potter. And he is wearing like a giant fake fur coat and he starts dancing to Thrift Shop by Macklemore. And um, I see her like leaning there and then all of a sudden she pulls her phone out of her pocket and she takes a picture of him, right? And then as he's dancing and he takes off his coat, he goes down to his boxers, which say like Weasley is king. And she comes up to the floor. She drops to her knees and she takes pictures as close as she can. And I just started laughing because I was like, she was so worried that this was going to be so awful and everything. And now she is in the front row trying to get hot pictures of Ron Weasley in his underwear. I don't even know what to do with this information. <laughs> um, so basically it's just nerdy people doing funny things. With nerdy characters. <laughs> For charity. For charity. There you mm. go. Classy. I have a suspicion that what you two really should be doing is running for the Senate. You know, you could really <laughs> reform American well, government for the better. You would never hold up to a Senate uh, run. I, I never want to be the guy. I want to be the guy the guy counts on. <laughs> there you go. Well, this is uh, 221BCON. You can find it at 221BCON.com. It's being held in Atlanta, Georgia from... April 5th through 7th, 2019. And, and as, uh, Crystal and Heather have said, it is a fan con for all things Sherlock Holmes. Get over there to the site and check it out. There's, uh, roughly a little over 30 days left before, uh, the con kicks in. There's still time to register and check out the, uh, the hotel and the schedule, uh, the guests, etc. Uh, it looks to be a very, very promising gathering once again. Now, Crystal and Heather, before we let you go, just one last thing. You recently have received uh, a bit of an honor uh, from the adventuresses of Sherlock Holmes. Do you want to tell us about that? Well, first of all, we were inducted, which was so exciting. <laughs> um, but they also um, allowed us benevolently to become the new co-editors of the Serpentine News, and we're very excited about it. What, is, what does that entail? For, for those of our listeners who don't know what the Serpentine Muse is, uh, could you explain it to us? Um, so the Serpentine Muse is a quarterly journal um, of Sherlockiana that's published by the Adventuresses of Sherlock Holmes. It is a fun little... Whimsical. Whimsical publication that any anyone whether you're a member of ash or not can contribute to and it has been in publication for oh gosh over 25 years it was 30 something i don't know the exact number i'm awful um but it the previous editors uh mary lynn mckay susan diamond uh, decided to step down after what, 22 years, I think? 25. 25 years. And we volunteered to take over. Not expecting them to say expecting yes. Expecting that they would never let anybody as immature as us ever handle something so important. <laughs> and they surprisingly said, Oh, sure, you can do it. And we are still kind of in shock that they have given us such an honor. It was. It's really awesome. They were they were very kind enough to start us out with the birthday edition, which came out um, during the BSI birthday weekend, uh, which luckily was a kind of short year in review. But now we're working on the March issue, which will be out sometime about mid to end of March, most likely. And we really are looking forward to doing it. Uh, Heather pretty much takes care of contributions because she's amazing like that. And I do formatting and putting it into book form. Yeah. So uh, it is a quarterly, so uh folks can check it out. It's only um $20, $20. per year. You can check it out at uh, ash-nyc.com. We'll have a link to uh the subscription page in the show notes so you can check that out. So congratulations on uh really the double honor, the investitures uh, and the co-editorship. Really well done. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, We're we still will. in shock. We will check back with you in 2041 when it's time for you to pass this on to somebody else. Yes. <laughs> we'll keep you in mind. I, I hope they're still letting us do it by then. They haven't gone, oh, what did we do wrong here? <laughs> uh, I am sure it is in good hands, as are all of the attendees of 221 Beacon. Heather, Crystal, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm really sorry that we didn't have a chance in the conversation to talk a little bit about the other cons. I had no idea Atlanta was such a center Hmm. for conferences on anime and Doctor – well, I knew Doctor Who, of course – but we didn't get to talk. You know, we never talked about the crossover really in any detail with Holmes and Doctor Who. And it would have been nice to know who their favorite doctor was. But boy, oh boy, um, what a what a great story. And I had no idea it's been going on. My goodness, for um, seven. This is the seventh annual. Seven, th- yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I had to just assume that Atlanta was a ghost town after, uh, you know, it was overrun by all the zombies in The Walking Dead. I didn't think there were. Still 43 cons. <laughs> <coming out. laughs> um, no, I mean, that's that. And, and look, this is an example, once again, where we find people that have other interests, you know, side interests, and, and they take what they learn from those side interests and they, they plug it into Sherlock Holmes or they take Sherlock Holmes and they plug it into that. Uh, it's, it's just wonderful how uh, the world goes round and round like this and, and how, uh, we make these ex- and the the people that are uh, that are motivated make these experiences better for uh, Sherlockians that wish to attend. Yeah, that's very well said. The people who are motivated, you know, make these experiences better for the attendees. I think that's um, yeah, that's well said. I was surprised. Well, I was surprised and not surprised to hear about sort of the generation gap issues. You know, early on mm-hmm. with. <laughs> With, um, and that's, I think, what it is. You know, there are people who, uh, you know, the world is full of people who are on various scales. You know, there are people who are sociable and not so sociable. There are people who are introverted and people who are extroverted. You know, there are people who are uh, enthusiastic and sort of reserved. But you sort of bump up against these generational crests yeah. in the ocean of life. Uh, and th- there are, you know, there certainly was. Uh, was I, you know, I remember around the BBC Sherlock, the early days of BBC Sherlock, um, you know, a larger community of whom the idea of encountering Sherlock Holmes in popular culture first and foremost and being attracted kind of, kind of as people were, as well as I was to Doctor Who and as I was to Star Trek, uh, you know, it was very alien. And so it's interesting, um, you know, to hear them talk about that. And it's also interesting to realize how far we've come that, uh, you know, that's not such a big deal anymore. Yeah. Well, you know, I think for, for certainly the more experienced Sherlockians that have seen these crests before, uh, the, these bursts in an interest in Sherlock Holmes because of some kind of pop culture movement, whether it's a television show or a movie or a major release, you know, they, they find that people are drawn to Sherlock Holmes like moths to a flame. And then you will probably only retain, you know, maybe 10% of those people as diehard fans moving on uh, when, when the, the crest has, uh, subsided. And, and I think that's part of the defense mechanism, right? Well, we don't want to welcome people too wholly into uh, the flock here because, uh, we know they aren't going to be with us for long. And it, that, that's, it, it's like judging a book by its cover. You never know where someone's passion is going to be sparked. And part of me, you know, when, when Heather and Crystal told that story of, of the older individual saying, well, you're too young. Part of me wanted to say, well, Methuselah, how, how old does one have to be to enjoy Sherlock Holmes? And, and I'm sure that that person was probably, initially attracted by the Basil Rathbone films, right? And, and mm. that, we've heard a whole generation of people that got attracted to Sherlock Holmes because of Rathbone. Well, if Rathbone can do it, why can't Cumberbatch? Or why can't Miller? Or why can't Downey Jr.? You know, there, there's no reason uh, that, that any one of these can't bring someone to uh, the, the, the wider Sherlockian societies. Well, that's true. And, you know, you and you speak very well about it and very passionately. And that's because for a variety of reasons. One is that, you know, professionally in your full Monty newsletter and other things, you know, you talk about aspects of this, but it's aspects of this related to technology. What's happened? You know, the the world is full of people who encountered when they were young in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s 
great characters, you know, Zorro and cartoon mm. characters, Superman, Batman, and who, when they were kids, put on the Halloween costumes and loved to watch the shows and um, over time assimilated away into, um, you know, and sort of lost that aspect of their personality. But technology um, operates against that in a way. It allows you to stay connected and to find other people. And there's whole story about the early registrations, you know, people who would pull over on the side of the highway I love that. and say, hey, you know, I better do this right now. Yeah. Where's my, you know, where's my, where's my phone? And so technology, you know, enables to sort of in that way uh, uh, drive against assimilation and allows you to stay connected to those things. Yeah, I think that's very well put. Well, you know, as you were were running down the dichotomy of people, the you know one type versus the other type, it it made me realize there are really two types of people in the world. Those <laughs> stay with me now. Uh-huh. Those who crave closure, and we'll be right back after <laughs> this important word. <laughs> the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex has begun restoring the Dorset Cursus, our Neolithic monument spanning 10 kilometers of the chalk downland of Cranbourne Chase. But we'll take a break from all that digging by reading another chapter of House of the Doomed, Dan Andriaco's adventure of Sherlock Holmes, published by our Wessex Press. In Surrey, Holmes and Watson encounter the writer Arthur Conan Doyle. Rumors of ghosts and occult rituals add to the mystery and suspense. And they meet an old friend, the one police detective on the same level as Holmes himself. March is the month of expectation, the things we do not know, the persons of prognostication, the Phoebe and the Crow. As the days lengthen, reach for the pleasure only a volume from the Wes Express can provide. Choose yours today. And now we're pleased once again to welcome back Matthias Bostrom to the program for his regular column called As We Go to Press. The press is a very valuable institution if one knows how to use it. I must make something of it. Although I've no doubt that every newspaper in London will be on the street to the full and detailed account. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. This is As We Go to Press with Matthias Bostrom. You know what? There's not a day without Sherlock Holmes in the news. We pick a random date with our random date generator. And this time it stops at... It's 1952. It's April. It's the 26th. We pick a headline from that day. Yes, we have one from the Daily Republic in Mitchell, South Dakota. And there's an article called Betty of Barons by Elaine. But it's not an article. It's actually an advertisement. And this Elaine says, I found I was not the only one with spring fever, for when I visited Barron's this week, I noticed that all the girls had that look in their eyes like they were dreaming of being outdoors, soaking up the sunshine. However, all I had to do was say, What's new at Barron's? And they all started to hum. What was new at Barron's at that time? She mentions two stunning hats. Terry cloth for the youngsters also, short with elastic uh, waist and two big pockets for only one ninety eight, and a matching polo shirt with ribbed neck and cuff on short sleeves for also one ninety eight, And on the balcony, that's probably a, a part of this store, the new fad for the young people is the Sherlock Holmes hat. double build of checked material with ear flaps tying on top makes you think Holmes and his friend Watson might pop out of a corner any minute. 
There is a magnifying glass to complete the outfit, but you furnish the pipe. And you can get it for 150 What is interesting is that April 1952, that is exactly when the newspaper started writing about the new Sherlock Holmes exhibition in New York, the one that Adrian Conan Doyle was planning, the one that had been in London the year before and had now been imported into the United States. And actually, what I also found on 26th of April was a little short notice saying, a bottle of London fog has been shipped to the United States in connection with the Sherlock Holmes exhibit. There was a lot about Sherlock Holmes in the newspapers at the time. Maybe that was influencing parents to keep a Sherlock Holmes hat in their store for sale. So don't forget, visit Barons and buy your own dear stocker. I am so glad that we have this link with Matthias and that we can hear his voice, but also benefit from his enormous, <laughs> at this point, enormous inventory of things relating to Sherlock Holmes in the newspapers. And... Um, to pull these things out. You know, it's just fascinating and it's great to hear. him. It absolutely is. And as you know, there is no danger of Matthias running dry at any point. And as a matter of fact, um, the, nothing wrong with a little healthy competition. Um, Matthias has his own podcast now. Um, and, and it's not really competitive with us. It is complimentary because you can never get enough Sherlock Holmes, and everybody has their own approach to it. Matthias's new podcast is called Talk About Sherlock. It is a monthly program of about 25 minutes in length, and it is designed to be uh, kind of an audio companion to his monumental and groundbreaking book, From Holmes to Sherlock. We will have a link to Talk About Sherlock in the show notes for you to check out as well. Well, one of the things we wanted you to check out is listener comments. You know, we recently noted that we finally figured out how to handle our voicemail system, um, <laughs> a, a boon to technologists everywhere, and the calls have been flooding in. So let's grab uh, this one that we got uh, just after we posted last uh, the last uh, episode. Good, good evening. My name is J.C. Mullins. I'm calling from Huntsville, Alabama. I'm a member of the Greek Interpreters of Athens, Alabama. And I have Parkinson's disease, so I have a hard time talking, so please forgive me if I don't sound clear. I wanted to thank you guys for out here, Sherlock Everywhere. I love the podcast. I listen to it every day. Actually, I listen several several times a day. Being disabled and retired, my life is, is Sherlock Holmes every day. I'm I'm 50 years old. I've been battling Parkinson's since I since I was 17. I've been a collector and reader of Sherlock Holmes since I was eight. My home is a Sherlock Holmes museum. My living room is a, a actually a Sherlock Holmes library. And since I've been a reader and a collector, Sherlock Holmes has been my constant companion all these years. I'm a single father, so my son is fixing to start college soon, so... I've been collecting more memorabilia and books to fill my home with things for me to do. But I just wanted to thank you guys for the podcast. I love the shows. I love the commentary. I love the subjects that y'all choose. Y'all are actually quite funny. I enjoy uh, hearing, hearing you guys speak. And I'm very thankful because y'all are giving me something to do. When, when I'm not reading or watching a Sherlock Holmes movie, having the podcast is like having you guys 
right here in my home sort of fills me with a sense of security and happiness to hear the podcast. But I wanted to once again thank y'all very much. I'd rather enjoy what y'all are doing and please keep keep up the good work. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Wow. Well, JC, um, from from our heart to yours, thank you for being such an interested and, and avid listener. And uh, it fills me personally with, with so much uh, hope and um, just warmth knowing that what we do really matters. I mean, yeah, we, we hear from people uh, from time to time. We certainly um, get feedback when we see people in person. Um, but having a a message like that from you and uh, hearing very personally your story about Sherlock Holmes and how the podcast itself connects with you, I, I don't think we could ask for uh, a better listener comment. Oh, amen. I, it's beautifully said. I have nothing to add to that except, uh, you know, my personal regards. And it, it, J, JC, it does mean so much knowing that you're in the room in the larger, in the larger room of listeners with us um, when we have these conversations. So bless you. Well, that music means it's time for us to take up the mantle of quiz show hosts once again and welcome you back to the set here on Canonical Couplets. If you'll recall... The last time we were here, we threw out a challenge, and interestingly enough, this particular entry in Canonical Couplets was one of our most challenging yet. Uh, We had a lot of incorrect answers come in, Uh, and before I tell you what the incorrect answers were, let me share with you what the hint was. A love triangle that ended in tense altercation. One suffered death and another mutilation. Bert, were you able to figure this one out? Oh, yeah. This was, this was actually pretty easy. It was the retired coloring book, wasn't it? <laughs> the retired coloring No. No. And, and you're not even close to the scent this time either. Um, oh, no. You, you fell into the same trap that a number of our uh, listeners did. We had entries that included The Hound of the Baskervilles and... Uh, the Crooked Man, The Cardboard Box, which are all excellent guesses. Um, but in this case, the correct answer was The Veiled Lodger. Ooh. The Veiled Lodger, right? Love Triangle. We had Eugenia Ronder, her husband, and then the strong man. Uh, and, of course, one suffered death, that being uh, the strong man, and another mutilation, which was Eugenia Ronder. Well, you know what? We don't even have to spin the big prize wheel this time because we only had one correct entry. And that went to Bill Treacy. Congratulations. Congratulations to you. Stay tuned for next steps on how we can get your prize to you. All right, now it's time for this week's canonical couplet. Here we go. And we're going to make this super easy to make up for the last episode's super difficult one. Here, Greek meets Greek, one might append, and how? And here, Big Brother Mycroft makes his bow. If you know the answer to this canonical couplet, send us an email at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with the subject line, Canonical Couplets. If you are among the correct responses, we'll choose you, and hopefully you'll be a winner. Good luck. Excellent. I can't believe we've done it again. <laughs> oh, and we'll be back here in two weeks to do this all over again. We'll have a little bit of a uh, a longer respite this time, or what feels like a longer one this time, because, of course, February uh, came a lot more uh, fast than uh, our typical end-of-month episodes. Uh, just as a reminder, we are 
on the air with you on the 15th and 30th of every month. Uh, and this time around, it is the 28th. So bonus for those of you who simply can't wait for another episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere this time. I always feel cheated by the calendar companies. I think somebody <laughs> owes me two days. Mm. <laughs> oh, you'll get it back in a couple of years. Don't worry. Mm, I suppose. Well, I am the necessarily brief Scott Monty. And I'm the abbreviated Burt Wolder. And together we say, The, the Games, games of Foot. foot. <laughs> the, the Games, games of, of Foot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes.